Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jesse Kearns, Project Assistant at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar entitled, Telling Your Water Story. This session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems Project. The EFCN provides training and technical assistance to small public water systems in all 50 states and five territories to help local water systems achieve and maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can see the areas of expertise that the EFCN focuses on. Workshops, trainings, and direct assistance are provided on asset management, rate setting and fiscal planning, leadership through decision making and communication, water loss reduction, and more. The EFCN also has a small systems blog. You can learn more about water finance and management through this blog. Blog posts feature lessons learned from our trainings and technical assistance, descriptions of available tools, and small systems success stories. You will also have the opportunity to subscribe to the blog at the end of the webinar. In addition to the workshops, direct technical assistance and webinars are part of the small management for small water systems project. We are also creating a table that lists the major funding sources for drinking water infrastructure projects for each state and territory. Here is how you access those tables. On the EFCN homepage, go to the Resources tab and then click on Funding Sources by State. This will take you to a map of the country. If you click on the state you are interested in, you will find a PDF table of the relevant funding sources for drinking water infrastructure for that state. The table looks like the image on the left of the slide. For each funding program, it includes the name of the program, a short description, and contact information for someone who works in the program. Before I turn the presentation over to our expert for today, I have two quick polling questions for you. At this point, I will turn the presentation over to our presenter. For our webinar today, we have Sarah Diefendorf, Director of the Environmental Finance Center West. Sarah, welcome and take it away. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, Today we're going to be talking about story and storytelling and why it's important for your water system or any organization that you're working with. Um, story is something critical. So we're going to start with the 2016 Value of Water Coalition Survey. And uh, this was a survey of water customers across the United States. And there's some good news here. So when people were asked how important is water infrastructure modernization, their responses, 70% said it was very important, and another 24% said it was somewhat important. So only 6% of the respondents across the United States thought that water infrastructure modernization was not important. That's, that's good news for us. Another question they asked was, okay, modernization is important. Would you pay more? The answers? 44% said they would be willing to pay 5% more than the current monthly bill that they already pay. Eh, okay. 26% said they would be willing to pay 10% more than what they're paying on a monthly basis. And about 13% said they'd be willing to pay 15% or more for modernization. Only 16% said no more, not paying another dime. Okay, so that's actually, again, quite good news. 84% would be willing to pay more. It's good news for us. So how do we get them to yes? Okay, we already know they're kind of heading in that direction, but they can change their minds, or someone can come along and change their minds for them. If we've ever tried to raise rates, or if we've ever tried to get people to pay more for things, we can pretty well be guaranteed that there's going to be someone out there who, when you decide that you need a rate increase, or an infrastructure upgrade, or investing for the future, Someone or some organization is going to say, no more taxes, no more increases, not on my dime, okay? And we know that happens. So how do we get them to yes? One of the ways is using story. And we especially can use story to make that hard sell, getting people to pay more. And especially getting people to invest for the future. Putting money down for things that they don't see right away, okay? It's a hard sell. So I'm going to give you an example of how I would use story for that. I'm from California, and so for us, storage facilities are a pretty big, big story out here. Storage facilities meaning dams. So if we look at this map, you can see where all of the dams are in California. Now some of those are small, some of them are not so small, but this is our water delivery system in this state. 
part of it, a major part of it. Okay, so infrastructure upgrades for water storage are pretty critical. If you look at a smaller map, the red dots are high hazard potential dams, basically meaning that it's a dam whose failure or misoperation will cause a loss of human life and significant property destruction. Yellow dots are significant, black dots are low hazard, but as you can see, a lot of red dots on this map of California. So if I were trying to convince Californians or my community that we need to upgrade our dam, I might actually show them this dams by completion date. So of the over 1,000 dams that we have in California, 55% were built before 1960. So we've got a lot of old dams. And even perhaps more frightening, 8% were built in the 1800s. That's a long time ago. And then I might go the route of talking about paying now versus paying later. Okay, so here's my cone of time. And at the end is the proverbial fan. And we don't want time hitting the fan. So I would talk to my customers and to my constituents about the lower costs if we act now. We've got a lot more options if we act before things hit the fan, right? So if we decided to make infrastructure upgrades right now before we have any problems, we have a lot more options and it's going to be a lot less cost. If we wait as time goes on and things are starting to break down, hmm, higher costs and fewer options come into play. And if we wait until everything hits the fan, okay, those are our highest costs and fewest options because what do we do? We're in emergency crisis mode. Something's broken. First we have to fix it. Then we have to perhaps make it bigger, better going forward. We have to deal with the human cost, the natural cost, and so on. Costs are much higher if we wait until everything hits the fan. But is that enough? Have I convinced anyone? that they need to put in some significant money for some water storage upgrade. I don't think so. I would tell them the story. And I would tell them the story of the Oroville Dam. So if you're from California, you probably know this story, but maybe not as well as you think you do. So the Oroville Dam was constructed as the tallest dam in the country in the 1960s. And here you can see a map where the Oroville Dam is. It takes water down from the Sierra Nevadas and brings it down into the Central Valley of California, feeding the crops and the agriculture in the area. The total capacity of the dam is 3,500,000 acre feet. It's a big dam. This is the dam when it was completed, primarily earthen. Here's the spillway in case there's too much water. And then over here to the left is what's called the emergency spillway, which is nothing in particular mm, doesn't really stand out from what the rest of the external areas of the dam uh, look like, but that was the emergency spillway, not designed particularly in any way as far as I can tell. So in 2000, concern was growing about the dam and the capacity to respond to a significant rain year. In 2005, Friends of the River Sierra Club and the South Yuba River Citizens League charged that the emergency spillway at the Oroville Dam wasn't properly built and posed serious risks. They sued the state of California. The state of California denied their claims as overblown and unfounded, and the state won. And at the time, and moving forward, well, there wasn't a whole lot of concern about the Oroville Dam, because if you look at this chart, you can see the water in the dam steadily drops from 2011 stretching out to 2016. So in 2008, this was your full Oroville Dam. But by 2016, after the most severe drought we've ever had in California, this is what the dam looked like. It was empty. But then something amazing happened. If you look at our extreme drought map, January 26, 2016, we were in a severe, severe drought throughout most of California. But by January 24, 2017, much of that had receded because, boy, it finally rained. There was so much rain that the spillway was enacted for just about the first time ever, from what I understand, and the water poured down. And we would watch it on TV 
helicopters were flying above. And when you've been in a significant and extreme drought for five, six years, you can't even imagine that there is this much water out there, that this much water can fall from the sky, and that we can just release it to the rivers. And that's what it looked like. And around January, it was amazing. We had rain after so many years of no rain. But it kept on raining. And problems started to occur. We started getting some major mudslides, especially in Southern California. Roads were being upheaved by mudslides. Trees were falling on houses. In my own neighborhood, we had five trees go down, blocking the road several times over the winter. And then, as they had to continue to release more and more water down the spillway, it started to eat away at the spillway itself. And after a fairly large rain event, there was this very, very large hole. And just to get an idea of what that hole looks like and how big it actually is, that red arrow points to people. It was a pretty big hole in the spillway. Yet more rain was coming. Not just more rain, a lot more rain. Expected throughout the winter. And it did. It kept coming to the point that places like San Jose were flooding. And in my knowledge, and my having been in California for over 30 years in the San Francisco Bay Area, I can't remember San Jose ever flooding. And they had to keep releasing more and more and more water down this spillway that was already damaged, but they couldn't get in there and fix that hole. So even more damage occurred. And then something really scary happened. The water turned from white and clear to brown and muddy, which meant that potentially that water was getting down into the earthen dam and maybe eating back into the dam itself. And a breach was a potential fear. So the Oroville Dam was considered to be on the verge of collapse, and 188,000 people were ordered to evacuate. And it was mayhem. People were driving, getting stuck. They could barely make it out. They ran out of gas. There were traffic jams. And nobody knew whether or not this dam was going to come crashing down behind them. It was an incredibly fearful night. I remember watching it on TV. And for a couple of days, people just trying to get out of this, this valley to get away from what might be a huge dam collapsing. But it didn't collapse. It did, however, become incredibly damaged. Here's a helicopter to give you an idea of how that small hole, which was not so small, became bigger and bigger. So this was the Oroville Dam, and there's the spillway back there in 2008. And this is what it looks like today. That's the spillway. They're working on it as we speak right now. And this just gives you an overview of what the spillway looks like and the kind of damage that that dam experienced as a result of a heavy rain winter in California. Huge devastation. The spillway is almost gone. And like that cone of time, we don't have the ability to go back and look at various avenues of how things will be fixed. We're stuck in emergency mode. We've got to get it fixed now. And we won't even talk about the costs of evacuating that whole area, evacuating 188,000 people, the cost to business, the cost to the local economy, and the continuing fears of a dam that nearly collapsed. Okay? So there was a lot of damage there and a lot of money that's going to have to be spent as a result to get that dam fixed. So, not long ago, California awarded a $275 million contract to repair the Oroville Dam spillway. So that's the end, right? Well, no, not really. Because last year we had more rain and snow than we've ever had before. And what happens if next year we get that same amount or even close to it? That means this dam needs to be fixed pretty much by November. That dam needs to be fixed by November. We're up against a wall, a lot of big costs associated with it. And 
when they started looking at the dam, some of the preliminary reports came out. And what they showed was that overall the spillway itself, those slabs of concrete are only 15 inches. Where that hole is, there was a drainage pipe underneath it. And the slabs were actually only six inches over the top of that, which is why it failed initially right there. And the slabs are built in 40 foot segments held together only by short steel dolls. So there's, the spillway itself is in critical, has always been potentially in critical danger. And there are 20 other California dams built at the same time and with the same standards. California hit the fan. And that's the story I might tell to get people engaged and interested and in moving to, to that point of where they might consider to pay a lot more to get infrastructure replaced, renewed, and modernized. You can also use your personal story. I use my own story to help people understand difficult concepts. I start by telling people I was born in Buffalo, New York. Go Bills. There's my family. If you're facing the screen, I'm on the left, my brother's in the middle, and my sister's on the right. Growing up in Buffalo at that time, well, it was before Bethlehem Steel came to a crashing end. This is Bethlehem Steel today, struggling, a super fun site potentially, nothing much there. But when I was a kid, Bethlehem Steel was this vibrant, torrid space of molten lava that we would see every time as we drove by going out to the Bills games. And it was fascinating to me, and it was filled with workers, and it was filled with life, and it drove the economy of Buffalo. But that's no more. We used to have a vibrant waterfront as well, filled with grain silos and shipping. But for the large part, that's no more. So when I think about Buffalo, and when I think about having grown up there, I think more about this little town called Port Colborne, which is actually in Canada. That black line divides the United States and Canada. And it's where I would go to spend my summers. That was my best friend. He and I would actually lay out, the guy on the right, he and I would lay out every night on the beach, dreaming about what life would bring us, telling stories to each other, wondering about our future, wondering about what the stars were there, wondering about who was up there. And that's how we spent idyllic summers in front of the fire, telling stories to each other. But at the same time, while we were on that beach, behind that beach was a lot of agriculture. And that agriculture created a lot of problems for the lake. It brought a lot of nitrates, a lot of phosphates, a lot of fertilizers, and dumped them right into the lake. And that lake became overgrown when I was a kid with algae. And that picture of algae that you see really isn't as bad as it oftentimes was. Because for me, I remember walking with algae up to my thighs walking through it, pulling a boat behind me so I could get out to clear water just to get into the boat and enjoy some water. And the algae stunk. It would lay on the, the, the sand. And if you didn't get a good storm to take it away, it would sort of consolidate and congeal and turn black. And it would stay there and stay there and stay there and get smellier and smellier and smellier to the point where they actually had to bring bulldozers down to the beach to bulldoze it up into huge mounds, at least get it out of the water. So sometimes our summers, our beach was dotted with these big mounds of rotting algae. That's what I remember a lot of as well, as much as I remember the fondness of laying in front of the fire telling stories. But something amazing happened. By the time I left, in about 1980, the lake looked like this. Because in the late 60s and early 70s, the National Environmental Policy Act happened, and the EPA happened, and the Clean Water Acts happened, and the water started to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And instead of a dying lake, we started having a living lake again. And the animals that I had watched disappear, the frogs and the birds and the great blue herons and so on, slowly but surely, were making their way back. And so when I left, I felt pretty good because my lake, my space, was saved. I moved to San Francisco, happy in the knowledge that what I left behind, my lake, my place, where I grew up, was solid and strong. And so when I went back, I don't know, 30 years, 20 years later, about 20 years later, it was really interesting because the water was still clear, but that wasn't sand on the beach. It was zebra shells. 
and they were sharp and they were small and they were invasive. You couldn't even walk on the beach anymore without wearing some sort of shoes. There was no longer sand on the beach. It was just this strange dead shells of zebra mussels that had invaded the lake and continued to eat through so much of the algae and so much growth in the lake that the lake was actually even clearer than when I left. But it wasn't really the beach I left. And then something even stranger happened. I went back about eight years ago. And wow, the zebra mussel shells were pretty much gone from the shore. You can still see them, but the algae was back. And they wondered, why? I thought we were done with this problem, but they weren't done with that problem because the zebra mussel shells, being so voracious and eating up so much, allowed the sun to get even deeper down to the bottom of the lake. And when the sun hit the bottom of the lake, more algae began to grow. More and more algae in some cases than ever before. So the algae was back, and in some cases across Lake Erie, the algae was back in a huge way to the kind of algae blooms that in my youth I never saw. I don't remember ever seeing like this to the part, point where in Toledo they actually had to ban the water. So why do I tell this story? The story about my lake, about agriculture, about industry, about banning water, failed industry, old industry, old lake, my system, my lake, there is never an end to this story. The story will continue on because we can't fix Lake Erie. Lake Erie is too complex. And I use my story of growing up on Lake Erie and the story of Lake Erie itself to explain complexity. It's another way to bring people into a complex issue in a simple way with a human story. It's also a way of sharing yourself. When you share your story with people, people warm up to you, especially if you can see them. Not as much sure if it works in a webinar format, but it certainly works when you're face to face with them. Okay? When you're sharing yourself and they like your story, they begin to like you, they warm to you, and if you're trying to give them some hard news about rates, about modernization, it helps if they understand better the issue, the complexity, and you. You want to share you. Everyone has something they want to have happen and a story to tell. Some people don't like to think about storytelling. It sounds like something we do with our children. So we need to remember, story is being practiced by organizations across the country. The U.S. Army tells story, Wounded Warrior Project. Environmental organizations tell stories. U.S. EPA on their website tells stories. Microsoft uses stories, and if you happen to be in Northern California, you would see PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, using story over the past several years because PG&E basically blew up a neighborhood. And they really need to get people back on their side. So what are they doing? They're doing a charm offensive with stories of all of their workers. You'll see it almost every night on TV, some worker coming out and saying, my name is so-and-so, and I grew up in the Bay Area, and I care about this. I raised my family here, and I care about, and they'll go on, and they'll tell you their life story and why they work for PG&E and why PG&E is so important, okay, and so valuable. They're telling stories. They want to move you into a space where you like the company again through story. Every organization, every major organization uses story. And why not? We've used story since the beginning of time. Story was initially implemented more than likely for our survival, okay? People would come back to the caves or back to their huts, and they, they would use story to talk about where the quicksand was, where the good eating was, where the dangerous berries are. We use story in our art. We use story in our telling to make sure that our people remain safe. Story was always about survival, and we do it today. Like I did on my beach with my best friend talking about story around the fire, we all do that. We huddle around campfires, enjoying a beer maybe, and telling story. Okay, and what do we do every night? 
We sit in front of that giant story box. Why? What is it about story? Why do we care so much? If Jamie Lannister does or does not succeed, or if he kills Cersei, or he doesn't, why do we care so much about Daryl? And does he escape the walking dead? And will he be a hero again? Why do we care about these stories? Okay? And it isn't just about fiction. Was this a good game? You bet you it was a good game. Look at that. In the first inning, it was 3-2. to two. Then we had in the sixth inning, it was out 7-4. to four, But oh my God, in the eighth inning, the game tightened up. It was tied. And right in the ninth inning, Albion took it. If somebody asked you, how was the game, you'd say it was great. And it was great because there was tension. And it was great because there was drama. There was story in the game. It isn't just about fiction. We respond to this kind of drama. And what about this game? I'm guessing that by the third inning, once we know the bigs are pretty much going to walk away with it, we might be walking away too. Great for the bigs if you're a fan of the bigs, but even by the fourth or fifth inning, you're ready to go home. You already know. They're going to win. There's no more drama to this game. The drama ended pretty much in the second inning, certainly by the third. And if you're watching it at home, chances are you're doing something else because it's boring. There's no story here anymore. There's no more tension. Our brain evolved to respond to story. It is a fact that when emotions are triggered, dopamine floods the brain. And we can't help ourselves. Okay, so stories, if they're good, games, if they're good, they trigger our emotions, and we get that dopamine. And dopamine, okay, under a good story, is coursing through your synapses, getting to your brain, and filling you with the same warm, loving feeling as you get from holding a baby, from having sex, from being with good close friends, okay? Good story triggers that dopamine just as well and gives you that strong, warm feeling that dopamine, the happy drug, can only give you. We are hardwired to respond to story. It is a neon sign to remember. Okay? Because why else? Why do we remember this? I bet just about everyone out there remembers where the wild things are. Why else? Do you remember this? Good night, moon. Being told by your parents, and then you, as a parent, perhaps, telling the story and reading it to your children moving forward. Where the Wild Things Are was written in 1963. Good night, moon was written in 1947. Yet we still tell the story. We remember them. But we don't remember this. How often have you tried to remember how to do statistics? if you ever have even tried to remember it, or want to. But could you? If you didn't go past Statistics 101, which, by the way, you would have spent three to four months learning, how many of you could actually remember what you did in statistics and repeat it now? Yet how many of you could tell me the story of where the wild things are? Okay, story is powerful. It's all about the story and how we tell it. Here's a guy public works worker working on a pipe and if he needed money for something specific he might come to me if I were the boss and say the pumps need variable frequency drives to match the water needs and create electrical cost efficiencies. Huh. Would I give him money for that? I don't think so. I'm not even sure what he's saying. There's a lot of jargon in there and there's not a whole lot of story and I don't really understand why he wants it. Here's another one. A techie. Yeah, that startup has some cool gamification, but it's an X for Y model. They don't even have a minimal viable product. And that space is already in hype cycle. Their only hope is to pull off an aqua hire, and even then I don't know if they have a total addressable market. Do I even know what he's saying? Would I be willing to invest or not invest or even take his advice? Filled with jargon, no story. Both of these people are missing a chance to tell a good story to convince me to buy into what they want me to buy into. Even if you have reams of evidence on your side, remember, numbers numb, jargon jars, and nobody ever marched on Washington because of a pie chart. If you want to connect with your audience, tell them a story. So here's a good example. 
This is Neil Armstrong, July 20th, 1969. Some of you out there might remember the day he walked on the moon or the night. It's a great story. It's a great story about Neil Armstrong. It's a great story about the astronauts. It's a great story about human endeavor. And by 1970, more than 50% of Americans said they were very interested in space exploration. They were getting their dopamine flood of a good story about humans against space succeeding. But then NASA had to change the story. The Apollo program ended and they moved more towards technology. They moved from people to technology. And the story became more about, well, the space shuttle. The space shuttle was the star. Okay? For many, many years, it was the only thing that you really saw that connected you to the space program, and it was lauded out there. They tried to call it things like the Enterprise to get you engaged if you happen to be a Trekkie. But the problem was, is if I think back to various payloads or why it was going into space, I don't think I can remember any. I can remember a handful of pilots, and I can remember the disasters. But ultimately, the space shuttle did not serve NASA well with regard to funding. Because really, at that time, rather than being favorable about the space program, the majority of Americans felt it cost too much. So we mothballed the space shuttle, because it did cost a lot. And we started doing things like the Mars rover, a little bit deeper space exploration. And they were exciting. They landed on Mars. We got some great pictures. <sighs> but we still got it cost too much. So NASA, NASA tried something a little different. Okay, I don't know if any of you guys remember this guy, Bobak Ferdowski. He was there in mission control, and he was helping to land the Mars rover, and he was young, and he was millennial, and they interviewed him. Unfortunately, it didn't change much, because by 2014, 22% of Americans were very interested. 45% of Americans were somewhat interested in NASA, and 33% not at all. NASA had to make some changes, and they did. In 2016, they launched A Year in Space. A Year in Space is a documentary about Scott Kelly and his year moving off into space, going up to the, uh, well, we all know where he's going, <laughs> um, the space station, okay? And it was a documentary that they made. It was the story of one man's journey to space. And it got people to the hmm point. People started to be interested. People started to check it out. People wanted to know the story. And so they released a documentary, which you can see on YouTube. Okay, NASA's gotten pretty slick. And NASA's gotten pretty dramatic. And it's pretty exciting. And if you look at their YouTube pages, They've gotten lots and lots of views, okay? They're telling the story, the human endeavor, again, of space, and they're telling the story of Scott Kelly, and by the way, it doesn't hurt that he's got a twin brother on Earth, and they're testing his body against his brother's body when he gets back from space so they can tell, actually, the real impact of space on the body. So it's a great story. And in 2017... Scott Kelly has 4 million followers on Twitter. The video itself has had over 100,000 views on YouTube. Scott Kelly has 1,135,000 friends on Facebook and was nominated for an Emmy Award. Okay? And most importantly, NASA's 2000 and 2017 budgets are the largest they have been in 10 years. NASA has gone back to telling the story of people, of human endeavor in space, and it's working. Story works. Okay? NASA has brought the dopamine levels up in people and how they feel about it. Story works. We have to have the facts and the data. We always have to have the facts and the data. But facts don't have the power to change someone's story. Your goal is to introduce a new story that will let your facts in. Change begins with a story. Good stories include strong video and visuals, especially 
if you are presenting to millennials, okay? We know that most millennials watch at least three to four videos every single day. They expect video and they don't want them to be long and they don't want them to be talking heads. Collect video on the things that you do every day, okay? Show people what it is you do. Use video and visuals when you present in your materials, your bills, your flyers, etc., and especially on your website. Your website should be a story about what you do. So what do good stories have in common? It's pretty simple. Stories tend to come in three acts. You start off in act one, maybe things are just fine, and then a barrier presents itself. Okay? I'm going to space. I have this beautiful life, this beautiful family, but uh, I'm going to space. And space is dangerous. I'm going to be taking off on essentially a huge bomb, and it threatens you. And if anything happens out there, there's no one to come save me. And then there's an end result, Act 3. I make it through, I survive, and I come home safely. Okay? Act 1, Act one. setting and barrier. Act two, maybe more barriers. Act three, maybe even another barrier, and then an end result. And you don't always have to, you don't always have to win. It doesn't always have to be a happy ending. Hollywood gets it. Life in balance, something happens out of balance. These are the types of movies that you see. These are the types of stories that people want to watch. Tell people what it's like to deal with opposing forces working with scarce resources. How did you overcome the fact that you didn't have the budget or the ability to create a new dam, to provide safe drinking water, to fill in the blank? How did you make difficult decisions? When did you take action despite the risks? And ultimately, did you uncover the truth? These are the kinds of stories that people really like to hear. They are engaged almost immediately. We trigger. We almost know what's going to happen. Hollywood gets it. Okay, little Lion King goes off into the world after his father is killed, experiences barriers and frights and friends, and comes back and becomes the Lion King. James Bond, everything is good. Then he's skiing down a hill. Then the bad guys are chasing him. And then he gets away from them. And then he meets a girl. And then she gets killed. And more bad guys come. And he meets another girl. And more bad things happen. And on and on and on until the end when he succeeds and saves the world, right? They know it. Hollywood knows it. Hollywood gets it. The whole NASA production is not unlike a Hollywood production. They've set up the barriers. The first video that you saw is the first video of the documentary series. They've set you up with the barriers, and now you've got to move forward to find out how does it end, right? But what if you're not Hollywood? What if all you have to do is talk about failing infrastructure? Well, this is how I might do it. First off, our water pipes are old, and if our water pipes are old, I want to show people what that water pipe looks like when it's old, okay? Show them. Don't tell them. Our water system is failing. What does a failing water system look like? Again, show them what you've got. Make people understand what it means. This pipe from 1882 burst this year. It flooded three homes. If you had a burst pipe, if you know you're going to a burst pipe, a broken main, get your video. Okay, this is powerful video. Most people in their lives will have never seen what a broken main looks like. And it's incredible when you do see one. Let people see it. Let people see the impact. Let people imagine into, wow, what would happen if that were my house or my car underneath that plume of water, right? Get your video out. And talk to the people who were impacted by the problem. I opened my back door and I got hit by a wave of water that knocked me almost on my butt. Okay? Use a quote from someone who was actually impacted by the water problem you're talking about. Show a picture and let people feel into what has happened and how drastic it is and how devastating it is to have your home flooded. And by the way, 
It took 63 job hours and it cost $26,459 to fix, which was far more expensive because we had to fix it after it hit the fan, just like the dam, right? We have to get out there. It's an emergency. The guys are making overtime. Make sure people understood what the imp understand what the impact is of having to deal with something after the fact. Oh, and by the way, these are all the water breaks last year in our community, and where that black circle is is our old town where the majority of our economic benefits come from. That's where all of our stores are, that's where people come to go out for dinner, and that's where the tourists go. Here come my data points, told in a way that people can easily understand probability of failure and the consequences of failure, so that central and west side pipelines are our most difficult and most in danger areas in the city so the people can understand. Don't show them a table and numbers and whatever. Make it simple. Make it move. Make them understand what do we need to deal with first. Obviously central, west side, then north side, east side, and then south side. 75% of our pipes are over 80 years old. Let people know what 80 years ago looked like. 80 years is one thing in the mind, but when you show people a picture of what it was like when you actually put in the pipes, it's a little bit scary to think that we're relying on pipes on the days that look like that. The arteries of our water system are clogged. They're bursting from the pressure. Don't be afraid to add drama. Water is the lifeblood of our community. It's true. We must start rebuilding today. We can invest in our infrastructure for a thriving economy. We can keep our water safe and clean for future generations because we all depend on a strong and reliable water system. Storytelling is an essential human activity, and the harder the situation, the more essential it is. What change do you want? Change begins with a story. Thank you, everyone. That ends our storytelling for today. The next one we do is going to be on Thursday, which brings us to messaging and builds off of storytelling and talks a little bit about that last piece that you saw and why the messages in it actually did matter. And thank you, Jesse. You can take the screen back if you like, or we can leave it up there, however you want to do it. Excellent. I'll keep it up there just for a second. We do have one question for you, Sarah, that came through. Uh, any other attendees that have questions, feel free to enter them through your chat or question box, and I'll try to get them up to Sarah here in the last couple of minutes that we have remaining to us. So, Sarah, that first question mm -hmm. was, how do you get local officials to understand the maintenance issue and fund ongoing maintenance of this infrastructure as with uh, this attendee's experience? Funding only comes when an emergency exists. So how do you get people to understand the problem before the proverbial fan? So basically, I want the elected officials to understand what that emergency means and who exactly it's going to impact. So if we're talking about, say, the failure of the water system, what does that actually mean? When you talk to your elected officials, are you talking about old pipes that need to be replaced? Or are you actually talking about property values plummeting, uh, economic damage done because there's no water to the businesses, damage to homes, potentially loss of life, contaminated water, children getting sick? There are a lot of different ways that you can talk about that emergency and that you can show what happens, just like the Oroville Dam, if I've got a dam that I want reinforced, I can show the Oroville Dam as an example of, hey guys, this is what happens when we wait and we don't do anything, even though we knew we needed to in advance. You need to help them imagine into and understand what is truly going to happen from that dramatic and life and human story point of view so that they understand also when their constituents come back to them and say, hey, why are water bills going up or why is the, the council voting on this, I can't afford it, they can actually translate what you've told them to their constituents so the constituents understand it as well. All too often we talk about upgrading infrastructure and we need to do it as opposed to the real human consequences of what will happen if we don't. The bigger issues, water is life, begin there. 
and move forward. Think about the story, the story you need to tell that translates that emergency to your elected officials. Excellent. Thank you, Sarah. We have another question that's similar to that, but a bit more challenging. So how do you deal with situations where the city manager does not want the story to be told to help protect the public officials? Yeah. Um, and boy, that depends on how sneaky you want to be. Um, it depends on what control that person has over the materials that you distribute, over the people that you talk to, over the website that you run, because you can tell your story uh, to your own constituents through the billing, especially through your website. There are other ways you can get the story out so that it actually, you don't have to go around that city manager, okay, but you in a sense are going around them in a way that reaches the constituents as opposed to trying to go through him to get through to your elected officials. Your whole, your whole challenge is to make the people that are paying and also the people that are elected understand the ramifications if they don't do something, but also give them the language that they can work with that will help them push through those changes, those rate increases, and so on. So I don't quite know your situation, but I would start thinking about ways that you can converse with your customers, your constituents, so that they understand, and then potentially there is some reverse pressure, or I assume the city council members are also your rate payers. Get that information to them through another channel. In a, in a way that is impactful through story. Great, thanks again, Sarah. And we have one final question for today before we run out of time, and that is, is there any difference on how we tell the story to different age groups, like millennials yes. versus boomers, Gen Xers, that sort of thing? Yes, absolutely. Um, every age group responds to different stimulants. Every age group responds to different visuals. If I were to show, say, the moon landing to, and, and using it as this is a glory moment in my life to a bunch of millennials, they're going to be looking at it thinking, I saw that in my history book, okay? They may or may not be interested in it at all. Uh, millennials definitely want to see video. They want to see a video that's shorter than two minutes. Older people might, say baby boomers might have a larger capacity for something longer. At the same time, you probably aren't going to talk to millennials um, or Gen Ys about property values, but you certainly are going to be talking to baby boomers who want to sell their house someday about property values. Um, so you have to think about what resonates with each age group, and there's a lot of information out there, um, and some of it will be, well, actually, I guess we already did introduce it on, on presentations on presentations, but maybe we'll talk a bit about it on Thursday as well. There's a lot of information out there on what engages each level, um, each age group. And you need to do a little research and find out what do you think is going to reach each one of them. But yes, absolutely, it's different for each one. For the slides that did not appear in the beginning of this presentation, those will be made available as well. So for those of you that did not see those at the beginning before Sarah's presentation, those will be up on the website as, uh, as well. So you should now see that link in the chat box. And I thank you all very much for joining us today, and especially a big thank you to Sarah for providing an in-depth look at today's presentation entitled Telling Your Water Story. Uh, Sarah, do you have any additional closing comments for today? Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, join us on Thursday for a discussion about messaging. All right, excellent. Thank you all again. I hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you.